When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Exactly two Sundays ago, Betsy Kirk and I and a couple of friends had gathered in a church in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and were sitting not in pews, as we usually do in churches, but rather were in chairs. And we were in the Memorial Church of the Prince of Peace in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, for the Holy Eucharist. After years of study and reluctance to act, this year the church was renovated by removing the pews, arranging chairs so people could see each other through the nave of the church, almost like a, a large fish pattern, and bringing the altar down from its high step to the level of the people. You see, it's a small congregation, and that made sense for them. It's a church that's had some struggles over the years, and they and a Methodist church right next door were both burned by an arsonist in 1970. And after that, the churches, I think, <coughs> kind of regathered themselves and redo whatever they needed to do in their buildings. And here, in just this past year, with a rector who had the right kind of experience, dealing with historical buildings and how to care for them and perhaps re-renovate them, they were able to accomplish that which they had talked about 
for an awfully long time. It's interesting not only because they took out the pews, but they have arranged the chairs, as I've said, so that people could see each other. And the organ pipes are now where the altar used to be, and the console is about where our, our console is for the organ here. And when the people enter that church, they have something that'll be familiar to all of you, I think, here at Holy Trinity, and that is they have uh, put on the floor in the back of the church, there's no carpeting, a, a labyrinth, so that on days of private devotion, days maybe for the Stations of the Cross during Lent, they can observe that labyrinth and participate in meditation and in prayer. It's quite a stunning place, and if you're in Gettysburg on a Sunday morning, I recommend visiting the Memorial Church of the Prince of Peace. We had gone to Gettysburg that weekend to tour the National Battlefield and Cemetery. The church was erected from 1888 to 1900 to be a memorial to the 50,000 soldiers, Union and Confederate, who died in the Battle of Gettysburg, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863. The battle was one of the bloodiest of the Civil War, and it marked a decisive turning point. General Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia lost about 28,000 of its 75,000 men and would never venture again into the North. On July 4th, as the decimated Army of Northern Virginia fled south from Gettysburg, General Ulysses S. Grant won another major victory at Vicksburg, Mississippi. Together, these two victories really spelled the beginning of the end of the Confederacy. And four months after the two battles, on November 19, 1863, the Gettysburg National Cemetery was dedicated on a sweltering day by President Abraham Lincoln. And so it is fit, I think, that we hear patriotic music as our organist played to begin and prelude to our service this morning. Lincoln's 272-word address was preceded by a two-hour survey of world history by Charles Everett, the president of Harvard University. Keep in mind, in those days, two-hour addresses were not uncommon and were actually pretty much the fair of the day. I'll spare you that much time this morning. <laughs> and I can almost say I have my subject now in sight. <laughs> President Lincoln, in a brilliant recasting of the war, made it as a struggle for adherence really to the Declaration of Independence and called the war an opportunity, a new birth of freedom and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Almost two years later, and many thousands more deaths, the Civil War finally came to an end in April 1865. The final toll would be 600,000 deaths, and it would haunt this country's beliefs and a benevolent God when the full extent of the carnage was known. President Lincoln, like an Old Testament prophet, saw the war as God's judgment upon America for slavery. To help us remember the human cost of the Civil War, some former slaves in South Carolina decorated graves of Civil War veterans within weeks after the war ended. Waterloo, New York, was later credited with the first municipal observance of what was called then Decoration Day. Some of us older folks remember that's what it used to be called. And that began officially in 1866. <laughs> then, over 100 years later, Decoration Day was renamed Memorial Day and later moved to the last Monday in May. Hence, tomorrow. So here we are this morning on both 
Memorial Day weekend and the day of Pentecost. Liturgically, today we come to the 50th day of Easter, the end of that season, and the start of a new one by the same name of Pentecost. Our holy scriptures today narrate two different traditions about the giving of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. The first is from the Acts of the Apostles, which we heard. We believe that Luke, the beloved physician, wrote both the gospel that bears his name and the Acts as a continuation, a history of the early church's growth and development in the power of the Holy Spirit. We heard today a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. It's 50 days after Easter, the day of the resurrection, and many other disciples are gathered, not just the original 12 or the 11 minus Judas Iscariot, and they perhaps return to Jerusalem to a house. From heaven there comes a mighty wind and tongues of fire that rested on each one of them. All of them are filled by the Holy Spirit and begin to speak in other languages as we heard this morning here in church. And as the Spirit empowers them, they give voice to God's wondrous deeds wherever and whenever they have come from. The onlookers are amazed that each hears in his own language God's deeds of power. But someone sneers and says the disciples are drunk with a new wine. Peter, the leader of the disciples, says in a loud voice that this event was foretold by the prophet Joel, who said, In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, young men shall see visions, and old men shall dream dreams. Yes, I had a few of them last night as one of those old men. <laughs> Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall prophesy and be saved. I know we live in a conflicted, fearful time here in this country and abroad. Each day I wonder if the President and the Congress can avert going over a cliff and defaulting on paying our debts that didn't worry the Congress just three years ago and three times when a different person and a different party occupied the White House. I'm concerned about the world's lack of action to stem climate change before it's too late. I worry that AI, artificial intelligence, will proliferate on social media with misleading information that could undermine democracy and lead to social chaos. I pray for the millions of refugees, the greatest number I believe ever since World War II, who are now fleeing autocrats or fearing starvation, and I pray for peace with justice in the Ukraine. So that first Pentecost tradition from Acts is that God is still with us in the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will never leave us comfortless, but is always there renewing hope and telling the truth about God to the world. Indeed, the Holy Spirit reminds us of all that Jesus said and did and empowers each of us to proclaim the good news to others. The second tradition concerning the giving of the Holy Spirit comes from St. John's Gospel that we also heard this morning. It's now Easter evening. The disciples are gathered together behind locked doors, fearing their imminent arrest by the Jewish authorities, just as they arrested and executed their leader, Jesus. In ways I cannot explain, Jesus passes through the locked doors of the upper room and speaks to them, peace be with you, after which he shows them his hands and his side, and now they rejoice as they finally recognize him. For us today, the risen Lord also comes to us, perhaps as a stranger, like he did to them in the upper room. 
or a refugee or a disabled person who needs our help. God comes to us again in millions of ways. To us, Jesus says again, peace be with you. And adds, receive the Holy Spirit, and as the Father sent me, even so I send you. What is this peace that Christ offers? To me, it's derived from the Jewish word for peace, shalom. It means wholeness and promise for those who believe in God. It denotes completion as God calls us into a loving relationship with God's self, the creator of all life. It is what God does for all people who trust in his goodness. Ultimately, the peace of the Lord Jesus offers to us is health for the mind, serenity of purpose, and salvation. Nothing less than salvation. When Jesus says, peace be with you, he is really saying, you have been saved by God. God's peace is the freedom event par excellence and healing for individual believers and for the body of Christ, the church, and all those who live maybe in the shadows of fear and death. We see glimpses of the peace that the Lord Jesus offers each day. We behold God's glory in creation and the animals and people we care for and in the causes that inspire our commitment. We learn about God's peace from others, even when we may not always feel it ourselves or see him in others. I hope that some of you were able to attend, and I know that you were actually, our gala for Bishop Stokes last Sunday evening at the Courtyard Hotel in Cherry Hill. Bishop Michael Curry embodied that Holy Spirit at the gala as he thanked Bishop Stokes for bringing the people of Cuba back into the Episcopal Church as a whole because they had been separated by our country's animosities after Fidel Castro's revolution. And now in these last few years, Cuba is once again part of the Episcopal Church. It is not just the national church as we sometimes call it, but rather the Episcopal Church in the United States and 16 other nations. It is God's ability alone then that it enables us to transcend barriers with others, with groups, and yes, even with other nations as well. It is an integral part of St. Paul's greeting in his letters to churches and various individual Christians. Grace and peace, he says, be unto you. And he says it often and with great fervor. In fact, Paul asserts that even Christ is our peace. You see, the peace that he offers is not just a word of assurance, but it is his very self, his life, death, and resurrection given for our edification, for our salvation, and for God's glory to be revealed in the world. In fact, Paul asserts that in giving Christ as our peace, God has overcome the barriers between Jew and Gentile, male and female, and slaves or free persons. In baptism, you and I put on Christ and are forever made new creatures, called to witness to God's peace offered to the world. Peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you, said our Lord Jesus Christ. Not as the world gives do I give to you, but a peace that it passes all human understanding. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.